Welcome, everyone. We have a lot to talk about, and we want to make sure we don't shortchange you. So we're going to get started right away. So today's our topic is going to be enterprise continuous integration and continuous delivery with OpenShift. My name is Andrew Block, and I am a principal consultant at Red Hat, and I specialize on cloud and integration technologies. So with Red Hat, that's primarily around the OpenShift, OpenStack range, and on the integration side with JBoss Fuse and AMQ. I, and when working with these technologies, I typically implement CI CD solutions with them to accelerate application delivery. I work on a wide range of open source technologies and also contribute to a large number of them. And I'm also an avid technology writer and blogger. Hello, welcome. My name is Jared Burke. I'm a senior consultant with Red Hat and the Red Hat Consulting Services Group. Uh, I'm a cloud and migration specialist. I've had the privilege of working with numerous Red Hat clients, being able to deliver uh, enterprise solutions to various challenging, challenging problems to various enterprise solutions. Uh, I've also special, uh, specialized uh, 50 years, 15 years of software engineering. I've been privileged to work with Andy both internally, uh, with internal communities and uh, open source initiatives. Um, Andy, Thanks. can you tell us what's going, what we're going to be talking about today? Sure thing. So, the first thing we're going to do is we're going to. Why do not we? One moment, everyone. <laughs> Love technology, isn't it great? I know. What's going on? <laughs> um, oh, we lost internet. There's no internet. So Having some technical issues with the internet. Conference Wi-Fi, it kind of happens, unfortunately. I'm going to refresh it. Refresh the page. One second. Do we lose sync? We just go back to what's up. Oh man, this is killing me here. I have so much to tell you about. Oh man. Oh, refresh that page. Refresh that one. So I think we had two windows open up, and the they, they got unsynchronized. So you know how conference Wi-Fi is. Go ahead, reload our deck, start the presentation, we'll be off and running. Full screen. Hmm. Let's, let's, maybe. Ready? So, this is what we talked about a second ago. Didn't really reali realize we weren't you now showing it to you guys and gals, but that's what we just talked about. And let's go ahead and talk about what we're going to describe today during our session. So. First thing we're going to do is we're going to have a brief component overview. We're going to talk about the different components of OpenShift and the different technologies and methodologies when it comes to continuous integration and continuous delivery. Then we're going to go ahead and talk about OpenShift in the enterprise. What does it mean to deploy OpenShift in an enterprise scenario? And what are some typical deployment paradigms for deploying OpenShift? Then we're going to talk about the concept of image promotion. How do we promote images through different environments within an OpenShift deployment? We'll then talk about how an open, pardon me, how a image lifecycle works in a typical enterprise environment. What does that look like? And finally, we'll go ahead and talk about how to implement CI and CD in OpenShift. So, what is OpenShift? So, if many of you all have been to any of the other sessions, maybe the keynote this morning. It's a platform as a service, a uh, technology that's built on top of Docker and Kubernetes for running containers at scale. As you can see, OpenShift does not only include these two technologies, but it's also backed by a large ecosystem to help you deploy more, faster. It's available in several flavors, depending on the use cases. Uh, we have OpenShift uh, Enterprise, which is our uh, private cloud offering that you can manage, organizations can uh, m manage on their own and deploy on their own infrastructure. Uh, we have OpenShift Dedicated, which is the uh, public cloud that's managed by Red Hat, 
and OpenShift Online, which is the public cloud offering so you can deploy your applications to a public cloud. So the next big topic we want to talk about really is the crux of why you're here today, continuous integration and continuous delivery. So what is continuous integration? A quick overview for those who may not be as familiar with the topic. So continuous integration is really the application of validating, applying, and testing a change that occurs to a shared source code repository. So in an enterprise situation, you're going to typically have multiple developers working on a common code base. They can go ahead and work on features locally and test them, and that's work, and it works fine in their own local environment. However, with multiple developers working on the project, the changes they make locally may not sync up quite well with those of other changes. So the idea behind that is to go ahead and test and validate everyone's changes every time a change occurs in source code. So every time a commit occurs and to the repository. And then the second key point is after that, after that build process occurs, let's say a failure happens. It happens, you know, I go ahead and fat finger something or two conflicts occur. Notifications. We want to make sure that we notify others that an issue has occurred. And that's the key so that you can quickly resolve the issue and then get back to operational state. The next, iterate, next part is continuous delivery. You've gone ahead and taken your code and validated and tested. How do we go ahead and get that into our deployable environments from development to testing all the way up to production in a, explicitly in a repeatable fashion? We want to make sure that this process we can continue to do every time and it's the same no matter what. Dev, test, stage, production. All, automa and all in a primarily automated fashion. There are some manual steps, so it's not completely automated in all cases. So when working on a software project, especially one that's leveraging CI CD principles and methodologies, there are going to be a number of tools that are typically involved. <clears throat> For managing so that, CIC, that, that CICD process, you'll need tools such as Jenkins uh, or Travis uh, in order to, um, to help you uh, orchestrate those jobs. Uh, you'll have that tool re retrieve code from a source code management repository, something like Git or Subversion uh, or your flavor of choice. Um, that'll typically uh, do your building and will push um, your de resolve dependencies and publish those artifacts to an artifact uh, repositories such as Nexus or Artifactory. You also have tools such as code quality management that you'll want as you that you'll integrate for automated testing. Um, and then of course for your project managers out there in the crowd, we have issue management and project management so you can track uh, the, the 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 full life cycle of that of your project. Out of the box, OpenShip is a platform that enables continuous integration uh, and delivery features that, that would be desired, such as integration with source control management tools, configuration, facilitating the build process uh, within the platform, and deploying to elastic compute resources. So the cloud really does make it easy. A developer goes ahead and has an idea. They're going to go ahead, put the pen to paper, put the virtual pen to paper, get the source code out there, commit it. Now, being good developers that they are, they're going to go ahead and store that, that, that code in a source code management system. They will then have some build process, some build process to compile an artifact, go ahead and d resolve dependencies, get the product ready to go to be eventually quickly deployed to the application. And just like that, you have a running application from build all the way down to deployment. However, and then we talked about how easy it was to do that in an open cloud environment. Once you start introducing an enterprise scenario, you start having certain challenges that come up. The first one being a corporate proxy. Most organizations have a corporate proxy in place so that all traffic destined for the public internet will go through a, a single source. Devel um, local machines will not go directly out to the internet. You also have disconnected environments. You may have environments that have no access to the public internet. So especially when you have developers working, they might need third-party dependencies or be able to access external sources. Next is multiple data centers. How are you going to handle the deployment to, uh, to multiple data centers of your OpenShift environment? How are you going to go ahead and resolve those dependencies? We talked about that a moment ago. How, how are you going to get access to those? And then finally, how do you manage the software development lifecycle that is typically found in an organization? 
Every organization is different. You know, Jared and I are both consultants. We go work with customers constantly. Each organization has a different business process. How do you manage that in with OpenShift? So let's go ahead and talk about how we solve some of these challenges that are typically found in an enterprise. First of all, the corporate proxy, everyone's favorite. Uh, how, many, how many of you have corporate proxies in your environment? How many of you like the corporate proxies? OK, so you must be the security guys, OK. OK, so corporate proxies play a role in a number of different places inside OpenShift, in an OpenShift environment. First of all is in Red Hat, is in your operating system, your system services, your base OS. Then with Docker, Do OpenShift is a containerization technology leveraging Docker. You, need to con you can be able to configure your proxies in at the Docker level. Then OpenShift is a, build in is a build platform. You need to know how to resolve not only your source code, if that happens to be outside your local, in local infrastructure, but also any third-party dependencies. And then finally, the applications that are eventually deployed to OpenShift, if they need to access external resources, how do you go ahead and provide it access to your, your public internet? So what are some of the simplified solutions that you can use to enable and reduce and eliminate the issues with corporate proxies? One is, go ahead and configure the proxy configuration at an operating system level. Go ahead and configure it not only at the Red Hat Enterprise Linux level, but also configure it in your system services. In OpenShift, OpenShift provides a concept of templates, application templates. So you can go ahead and quickly configure all the changes that you need to be made to enable your developers to not worry about the proxy configurations. If they need to go ahead and deploy a PHP application, there's a template already in place for a, the PHP application. That proxy configuration is already in place. They don't have to worry about it. It's there, configured already. And finally, go ahead and configure the proxy configuration at the OpenShift cluster level. There are multiple places in OpenShift that you can configure proxy configurations, one being in the master and node configuration, and the second being in also in the master configuration, you can set, explicitly set where your build um, source code resolution can come from, as, long, as well as environment variables that are automatically injected into your running applications. So now we'll move into some of the biggest challenges that we do face when we, when we implement OpenShift within the enterprise. Uh, as you can see here, there are two distinct uh, environments in which we kind of have disconnected environments, or flavors of disconnected environments that we face uh, in enterprises. Um, typically, uh, you'll have either the dis fully disconnected uh, environment, which there's no access to uh, the internet, where you'll have to actually uh, have a in a, a server or in, in a machine that can actually access the internet in order to download the resources uh, and then import them uh, into the uh, in OpenShift environment. And or you have the, the secondary of the partially disconnected uh, environments where you have some limited available access uh, but not completely, uh, not fully accessed to, uh, to the internet. Um, some of these issues that, we, that you see uh, specifically is in the areas of installation, uh, such as RPMs, um, getting those down and getting them uh, downloaded. So we, we face that issue as a key, uh, that problem. So you can actually, to solve that problem, you can actually use uh, a satellite server um, and use that to download and then sync the OpenShift environment. You can also uh, uh, use a repo server where you download and then import them. Um, another major issue are the components within uh, OpenShift uh, that it needs access to a number of the base images. Those are usually pulled from uh, various public repositories, uh, something like Red, uh, Red Hat's registry, uh, or potentially uh, others that, that are out there that you would need access to. So you'd have to pull those in um, manually. And then, um, of, of course, the, the, uh, the third issue that you tend to run into is making sure that if you don't have access to the, to the internet, um, that your dependencies, uh, in order to have them properly assembled, will need those. You'll need to make sure that all of those are contained within your environment so that they're available uh, and your applications work as expected. So what does your OpenShift environment look like? It's really dependent on what your organization looks like. And, that's, and a couple of those ideas here are, what kind of access controls does, does your organization require? Do you have a strict access control policy, or do you have a not loose, but a looser one than, let's say, a, the FBI, a, financial, a heavily financial service organization? Uh, what kind of applications are you going to be deploying? Are they going to have a large number of resource requirements? What kind of SLAs are these applications going to have? 
and what kind of performance and reliability what do, do they need? So what are the what are typical deployment um, paradigms that we see when working with clients? The first one is a single cluster in a single data center. Everything all within one environment. The most common pattern that we see working with clients is multiple clusters in a single data center. So that would be typically a production environment, a production cluster of OpenShift, and a non-production cluster of OpenShift. And then the third is multiple separate clusters in multiple data centers. Go. So typically here you'll see uh, environment, uh, where you'll actually see uh, projects that can be separated into um, individual clusters where you have a dev, a, a test, and a, a prod uh, instance. Um, here you can see where we have app, uh, OpenShift projects that are actually in a, a full single cluster, but the projects are separated logically, uh, or the environments are separated logically by, by projects. Another option that you actually have, or a, for setting up uh, clusters is actually the paradigm of having a non-prod OpenShift cluster which will maintain your dev, test, all the way up through your prod, and then a, a production cluster that is only your, your prod uh, instance. So now that we've talked about the different logical separation of projects in OpenShift, how do we go ahead and promote images between these projects? Now let's take a step back and talk about continuous integration principles. A continuous integration principle is you build an artifact once and only once and then use that same artifact in all your environments. This ensures that the artifact that you deployed in dev is the same one that eventually gets deployed in production. This is a common and core principle of Docker itself where you go ahead and build your image once and then deploy it anywhere. So in OpenShift there are primarily two image promotion strategies that we see when working with customers. The first one is an image stream tagging, and the second one is the pulling and pushing of Docker images between projects. Let's start with first the image stream tagging paradigm. So let's take a step back and talk about what an image stream is in OpenShift. An image stream in OpenShift really is a virtual view of multiple related Docker images. Now these images can be located in different locations. They can be located in different repositories in the same registry, or they can be in totally separate registries completely. In addition, they can also refer to other image streams in other projects, and that's key when it comes to promoting between multiple projects in the, um, between projects using image stream tagging. So to do so in practice, the destination project, let's say we have a dev and a production project. We're going to put these in the same cluster. If we have a dev and a production project, the destination project must be able to access resources in the dev project, because the image is technically running in the dev project. And to perform the promotion process, we'll use the OpenShift command line tool using the OC, sub, OC tag subcommand to perform the process. So as you see here, we'll use the OC tag, and we'll reference the source, the dev project, the application my app, and then the tag 1.0, and then we'll refer to the image stream that's in the prod project, uh, pro, you know, prod project my app 1.0, and, and that will go ahead and pre uh, perform the tagging process. Now, OpenShift in its internal CI/CD capabilities has the concept of triggers. You can go ahead and perform a triggering action. Some action can occur when the, in an image stream changes. So, when you perform that tagging function, it will notice the image stream has changed, and then and actually you go ahead and deploy the application. Let's go ahead and do this in practice. So I have a single cluster of OpenShift here uh, split up between a dev project and a production project. And I have an image sitting in our integrated Docker registry in the dev project. I then associate an image stream with that and then because I have an image stream trigger on that, it will automatically deploy that application to the dev environment. Now if I want to go ahead and promote that to production, I go ahead and set up another image stream over in production and I use that OC tag command and tag over to the dev project. Since that image stream in prod has changed, since we have a trigger in place, it will automatically deploy that application to production, facilitating our deployment process. So what are some of the pros and cons when it comes to image stream tagging? 
the promotion process with image stream tagging. Now the pros are it's a very lightweight approach to image to um, the promotion process within OpenShift. And it really takes advantage of the functionality found within the platform. Some of the cons, unfortunately, is that you can typically only achieve this using a single cluster of OpenShift. And another one is that projects, as we talked about earlier, must be configured to trust one another. You must have production be able to access resources in other projects. And then finally, there is a level of abstraction that is caused by image stream tagging because under the covers, it uses the underlying SHA hash, not necessarily the tag. So even though you're deployed 1.0 in an environment, you might, let's say there's a security patch. You may have 1.0, but it may relate to another SHA hash than 1.0 previously. So it's a little bit difficult, but it's very easy to perform that promotion process, which is why it's pretty pop it is popular. Now the second promotion strategy is the Docker pull and push model using an external orchestration tool using an exposed integrated Docker registry. So let's go ahead and talk about how we do that. Once again, we're going to have our single cluster of OpenShift with two projects, a dev project and a prod project. We'll set up image streams in both projects, both dev and prod, and we'll go ahead and once again deploy that image or, or put that image into the integrated registry in the dev project. How you, how you get it there is up to you. You can go ahead and build the application with an OpenShift. You can go ahead and push it directly to that exposed integrated registry. Many ways of doing that. Once again, as soon as that image hits the registry, we'll have that image stream trigger, automatically deploy that to the dev project. Now let's, go, now let's say we want to promote that to the prod project. Our promotion coordinator will go ahead and reach into the integrated registry in the dev project, pull the image out, and then communicate once again with the prod project in the integrated registry and push the image to that project. Once again, image stream, image stream is set up to listen for that. As soon as it hits the registry, it'll deploy the application to production. So what are the pros and cons of the Docker pull and push model of the uh, promotion process? The first one, and this is the big one, is that it's agnostic of your OpenShift architecture. It supports single cluster, multiple clusters, it doesn't matter. Because all you're doing is you're pulling and pushing images. The only thing that matters right now is that your promotion coordinator can access both, pro both environments. And also, your OpenShift projects can remain isolated and independent. There is no need to trust each project. The cons, however, are that you do need to have that orchestration tool, that client, that promotion coordinator installed somewhere. So the Docker client does need to be installed on that machine. And also, there is the time it takes to pull, the, pull and push the image out. The promotion process with image stream tagging is very quick because you're just reusing the, integrated, the image which is in the integrated Docker registry. You're not having to pull it out and then push it back in. So the image lifecycle is going to take all of it all the groups, everyone, to actually make from start to finish to really work. Just like a Docker image is made up of various layers that have to come together and work, the various groups from operations, developers, business, uh, all of your stakeholders have to come together to actually maintain uh, that image lifecycle from beginning to end. The key to success is working together. <clears throat> But everybody has their own point of view. And from the ops perspective, as, as an op operations team member, it's going to be my responsibility to determine what images that, that can actually be used within the enterprise uh, to apply the corporate standards, uh, harden those to make sure that the images that th they're used, they're approved, and that the, uh, for the, uh, from the business and compliance standards, and that they're ready for, uh, to be consumed by the next uh, group. That next group typically, and this can look at a bit more, has a bit more variation from enterprise to enterprise, and typically focuses somewhere along the lines of middleware server components. These can be databases, application servers. These, some of these can be ready deployable. Other of these can be configurations for applying these. These are then handed off to either development team or deployed and as ready to use applications. And as a member of the development team, we have the freedom to choose the preferred flavor of the provided standard operating environment that the, the, our other previous groups have been able to, to provide for us. 
we're typically responsible for developing the code and, and deploying our application. Uh, you may also, we may also be responsible for managing uh, the operations of that. Now, a lot of times there's a lot of barriers for us working together. But if we can come together, we can adopt a standardized methodology and a, a, a standard artifact, in this particular case, the Docker format, as the currency for us to be able to collaborate, uh, communicate, and actually share each other's work. This allows us for each to maintain uh, control over the bits that we care about and, and actually operate within our own time and space and not affect each other's groups. What this really comes down to is a, is our, is a clean software supply hygiene supply chain. This allows you to actually use the Docker currency as the format for communication between various teams so that there's a clear, concise way of knowing what that the image that they built for me is going to be the one that I used to build my, my middleware. Uh, the core build, the core build will be the unit ones from the operations. I'll use the core build as the middleware team to actually build my next image. And then the application team will use the middleware to layer their application code on top of that. Working together, we come up with a final application again, <clears throat> that allows us to all to have a, a supply chain that's easily manageable, but at the same time uh, allows us all to continue to work uh, and ac accomplish our goals. So typically, you have a base image. You'll harden the, uh, you'll harden the, or the organization will harden the image. Uh, you'll then provide the image for the consumption either to your next team or the developers. Those developers will then build the application uh, and deploy it. And the image will be promoted and pushed in th through the various environments eventually into production. The various workflow trends that, you, that, you, that we've seen here in the, in the, uh, in the enterprise, uh, you'll see various things that, that the c container technology is changing, how many organizations are structured, how teams work together, and are, and are beginning to break down the barriers uh, of responsibilities. Uh, the time amount for customizations uh, that, that, are, that are being provided need to be shortened, and it actually enables full stack developers to be able to be more productive. So now that we've talked about how to deploy OpenShift, some of the in environment constraints when deploying the environment to an enterprise scenario, we've talked about how projects are composed in OpenShift as a way to logically separate different resources, how we go ahead and promote between multiple environments and the entire image lifecycle. Let's get down to the meat and potatoes here and talk about OpenShift CI CD. So there are multiple strategies for implementing conti continuous integration and continuous delivery with OpenShift. The first one is to use the out-of-the-box functionality found within OpenShift and provided by the platform. The second is to utilize existing tooling that might already be available in the enterprise and integrate with an OpenShift environment to perform the build and deployment process. Next, we'll go ahead and extend upon that and begin to utilize the elastic resources within OpenShift to run external agents that might be available using in your CI and, CI, CI and CD tooling. And finally, we'll go ahead and put package and containerize your entire CI and CD infrastructure within the OpenShift environment. So the first paradigm is to leverage the existing out-of-the-box functionality with uh, out-of-the-box CI CD functionality that OpenShift provides. OpenShift is a full platform that provides a number of solutions to really solve a lot of CI CD concerns that may be found in an organization. It's able to to access source, co source code management. It's able to perform builds. It's able to have webhook triggers and other functionality to trigger actions in the platform. It's able to build using the source to image process to able to take a base image, go ahead and layer source code on top of it, build, and then deploy that to the integrated Docker registry. And then finally, there are a number of images that are available to be used out of the box that you can go ahead and deploy and immediately see benefit within your organization. However, this is great for greenfield development, getting developers on the platform, but in certain organizations, this may, may, not, this may not be enough. It's great functionality, but it, organizations typically have a large number of requirements, reporting, auditing, that a full CI CD suite provides that 
may not be available out of the box. And that's where we go to our next concept, which is the leveraging your existing CI/CD infrastructure and going ahead and integrating it with OpenShift. So what you're going to do is you're going to integrate your existing pipelines, your existing jobs, your tooling, and then communicate with OpenShift using the API. The API in OpenShift is your lifeblood. Not only does OpenShift itself live by the API, your CI/CD tools will then leverage the API to perform actions within OpenShift. So if you want to have your, let's say your Jenkins server start a build in OpenShift, it can hit the API and then say, start this build, or how many pods are running? Did this deploy successfully? You can go ahead and configure your CI-CD tooling infrastructure to communicate with OpenShift to make sure that your workflows flow the same way that it had in your existing non-cloud-based infrastructure or non-OpenShift infrastructure as it will in OpenShift. And it really is a nice flexible transition as you start migrating more and more of your tooling over to OpenShift. Now, the next paradigm is a slight twist on that previous paradigm where you're going to continue to leverage your existing orchestration tools outside of OpenShift, but some of these tools may have what they call agents or may, may, that they call agents that can run in a enterprise elastic framework. So let's just say Jenkins. I'm, I'm a big Jenkins fan. I've contributed to Jenkins. I love Jenkins. It's a great CIC tool. How many in the audience have used Jenkins in their organization? Wow, that is a lot of people. Cool. So you at least understand where I'm coming from here. So Jenkins has the concept of masters and agents. In some cases, they're called slaves, but they're now moving towards the agent model. You can continue to use your master orchestration tool outside of OpenShift, but leverage OpenShift's elastic compute resources to run your slaves either statically or dynamically within OpenShift. This is great because slaves are, you know, they do the heavy lifting. Your, your masters are just your coordinators. They just say, start a build. How's the build doing? Great. Your, with your slaves running on OpenShift, you can go ahead and spin them up, spin them down. That's what Docker and Kubernetes, that's the meat blood of OpenShift, some of the benefits that it provides. So you really get a chance to further jump into more of that cloud resources. And, and if you take it one step further, you'll go ahead and fully containerize your CI CD solution all within OpenShift. So you can go ahead and take your entire build, deployment pipeline, and all of the infrastructure that comes along with it and deploy that to OpenShift. And one of the, some of the benefits of that is OpenShift itself provides some application templates and images that you can quickly deploy right now. So there's very little customization out of the box that you need to do to get your CI/CD infrastructure running. So we provide Jenkins. You can go ahead and set up a Jenkins master. And now, just released recently, you can go ahead and now spin up those dynamic slaves that I mentioned previously. Red Hat does now provide that as an option in OpenShift, in recent versions of OpenShift. So in a recap, We've seen that OpenShift provides uh, CI/CD capabilities and enables that in the enterprise. Um, challenges in the enterprise integrations, but there are solutions. And there's a number of uh, uh, multiple uh, image promotion strategies that are also available uh, with OpenShift. The image lifecycle is changing, how organizations uh, collaborate and work together. And there are various CI/CD tools that can be run within OpenShift or, or uh, existing tools that can be integrated with the platform. And, uh, All right. oh. and now, Andy, can you show us how this works in practice? I know everyone's excited about this. We saw Bruce Sutter this morning talk about you know, CI, CD, and a lot of the tooling that you can run with OpenShift. We're going to show you how you can go ahead and do this yourself using OpenShift CI, CD tools within the, infra within the enterprise. So we understand that enterprises have tooling in place. They want to continue to use the same tooling that they've been using for years, but still take advantage of the power of OpenShift. And that's what we're going to demonstrate today. So we're going to demonstrate a common enterprise pattern. As Jared talked about uh, during the image lifecycle section, you're going to typically have an ops team that's going to manage your, manage your base images, and you're going to have your application teams who are going ahead and building and, and collaborating and working to create new solutions for your enterprise. So first of all, we'll have our develop, developer point of view and our developer pipeline. We created and we worked on a new application, a new Wildfly Swarm application. So first, I'm once again going to go ahead and uh, borrow his from this morning. Uh, Wildfly Swarm is a Java EE7 technology that allows you to deploy JBoss EAP7 in a microservices container. Very, very lightweight 
it, which allows you to get applications spun up with minimal amount of resources. And the application that we created, all it does is to hit the API. Remember we talked about how the OpenShift API is the lifeblood? So this application is going to go ahead and request resources from that API to find more information about the environment. So really emphasizing how using the API is important when integrating CI, CD with OpenShift. That's our developer pipeline. Our ops pipeline are going to be primarily concerned with providing the, what we call the base image for our development team. So this is going to be extending on the base image that would come from a trusted registry, such as you know, the Red Hat Docker registry. It's going to provide and customize it with the necessary Linux, Red Hat Enterprise Linux packages, and any other security constraints that, and requirements that may be found and needed in, in the enterprise. So let's take a look and see what these pipelines look like. So this is our ops pipeline. Our ops pipeline is going to go ahead and perform the image build. It's going to go ahead and take the source code from GitHub, or pardon me, from Git, and perform an image build and tag the image for consumption by developers. And then on our, on our developer pipeline, we're going to, it's a, once again, it's a, a Java Maven-based application. We're going to perform that Maven-based application in, in our CDI CD tool and then communicate with OpenShift to go ahead and create that new Docker image and that will be pushed to the integrated Docker registry within OpenShift. And, and then once again, with an image stream associated to it, it's going to deploy to the development environment. Since we have CI, CD, CI and CD principles in place, we have a full pipeline that's going to go ahead and promote that to a user acceptance test environment, which is basically a separation, another project within OpenShift. Remember we talked about the logical separation of project within OpenShift. We have another project for UAT. Our Jenkins coordinator will go ahead and validate that the application is running, not only from OpenShift's point of view, but it's also going to hit one of the APIs to validate some business functionality, just so we have another level of acceptance. And finally, we're going to have a manual promotion to production. Now, with CI, CI and CD, there's the concept of continuous, continuous delivery and continuous deployment. Continuous delivery typically has some manual checks in place so that it's not completely automated, so that your team doesn't have to fully jump into a completely automated solution. They can go ahead and make some validations. They can double check their acceptance tests. They can go ahead and make sure the appropriate forms are set up. So let's say there's a service now or some other, to uh, some other tooling that is in your infrastructure for validating and promoting the application. Those are all put in place. And then we can go ahead and have a manual push button deployment to production. So what are the tools that we're going to be using in our demo today? We're going to using, be using GOGS an open source Git framework, Git server, so our source code will be managed up in Git. We'll use Jenkins as our build and orchestration tool, and then our Java artifacts as part of our Wildfly Swarm application will be stored in Nexus. And each one of these applications are containerized, all running within OpenShift. Demo. So now we're going to go ahead and get to, get to the fun part. Watch this happen. Gonna get out of presentation mode, and then we can go ahead and show the demo. Maybe. Isn't isn't technology great? Whenever you want them to work, it just does not play along. All right. So this is the OpenShift web console, and what we're gonna do here is we're gonna show you the different projects that we have configured in OpenShift. So we have a CI project. This is going to contain our entire CI infrastructure. So we have, we go in there, we have our GOG server, we have our Jenkins server, we have our Nexus server, and then we have Postgres that's, that our, our Git server is being backed by, all running with an OpenShift in the CI project. Now for our ops team, we have a project for them called Custom Base Image. And all it has is the resources to store that custom base Docker image that, that our app teams are going to use. And then on for our app teams, we've created three separate projects, a dev project, a UAT project, and a prod project. And that's going to represent different stages in our life cycle. So um, I got an email from compliance. Um, they basically said that all of the images that need to be deployed have to have this compliance file for some compliance requirements. So we need to make sure that our ops teams goes in and makes and modifies that base image to make sure that all the applications that are eventually deployed to OpenShift and deployed to production have this file in so it can pass its compliance and audit requirements. So this needs to be made immediately. 
It's very similar to a security patch, but it's a lot easier to demonstrate a compliance file than a security patch. So Jared is on our ops team. He's going to help us out um, going ahead and applying that change to, um, to our base Docker image. And we can't do that. We're going to go ahead and switch our monitors and pop it over to number one where our, where our uh, command line tool is. Wait for the resolution to come back, and we'll be all set to go. Maybe. There we go. So huh. we've gone ahead and cloned. We've gone ahead and cloned the repository. So it's now in our Git repository containing our custom base image. So can you just do a, a, a list file for that? If you list file, see we have a Jenkins file. So who's familiar with the concept of pipelines in Jenkins? All right. So Jenkins. Two, and also in addition, later stages of Jenkins 1, introduced the concept of pipelines, which allows you to create this, what they call a Jenkins file, which describes your, your build and deployment pipeline all, and have it stored within code. This basically allows you to connect not only your build process to your application code. So that's what the Jenkins file is. As you, also you see is we have a Docker file. So this, is, so this is the repository to build the Docker image. So, Jen, so Jared's going to go in and add a modification to the Docker file that will add in that compliance requirement that our team needs. So I'll go ahead and edit that Docker file. Let's go ahead and add a, another run command. We'll echo that out to about, hello, Summit. Hi, Summit. Direct that to a file. We'll call it compliance. Looks good. We'll go, go ahead and save that. We'll go ahead and add that file using Git. And go ahead and commit. Added compliance. Perfect. This is something that our ops teams would do on a daily basis, making sure that our, our base images are hardened appropriately so that our apps are secure as they go through the build and deployment process. And we'll push that up to. <laughs> oh, it's the origin wrong. Ha ha. Woo. Let's try that with the correct spelling. Perfect. The good news is we have a webhook configured inside our Git repository to call over to our Jenkins server. So let's go ahead and pop over to Jenkins. Because it's going to go ahead and set up a new build of our application. As you see down here, we have a new build running of our custom base image. Those familiar with, with Jenkins will notice that we're not building on the master, we're building on, on an agent running in OpenShift. So this is it, we're using the Kubernetes plugin to dynamically provision an agent with an OpenShift using the compute resources found in the platform. So our master can go ahead and do what it does, orchestrate and make sure everything's running appropriately. So that actually that went really fast, which is great. So what it did was it created a brand new Docker image in OpenShift, pushed it to the integrated Docker registry, tagged it, and then made it available for our application teams. So our application teams have, has an image stream listening for changes on that base image. So Jenkins is now listening on that image stream. It's listening for changes every minute. So it's not going to be immediately, we got to wait, you know, do advance some time, assume the you know, app team went for coffee, they didn't notice. Um, it's going to go ahead and in a moment, as you see there, we now have a new app, be, our new app pipeline starting. And this is what our app pipeline looks like. <laughs> so our app pipeline looks like the following. We're going to check out our code from Git. Or we're going to perform a Maven build within, within Jenkins. We're then going to take the artifacts that we, can, that we produce as part of that Maven build and push it to OpenShift to produce, produce a new Docker image. Once that new Docker image is produced, it's going to push, the co push that image to the integrated Docker registry in the dev project. This pro the building of the, of the image occurs in the dev project. So right now, if you're familiar with Maven, we'll just go look at the logs here. It's going to, as always, download the world. It's Maven. How many, 
Maven. How many of you are Java developers? How many of you love Maven? Maven's good. Maven's great. However, sometimes it can, it, it's a little heavy when it comes to the network requirements for downloading images and applications. Good news is we are using Nexus, so all it's doing is it's going to go ahead and communicate with over to our Nexus server. But still, since we're running in um, ephemeral pods right now, a, a pod is a concept of a resource that can deploy Docker images with an open ship. We're spinning up new pods every time, so it has to download all the artifacts again from our Nexus server. An improvement down the line would be to mount a volume of some sort that contains all of our artifacts that may have been cached already from third party sources. But for this demo itself, we're just going ahead and just grabbing the artifacts again. So we're going to continue to go down that process. Let's go back, to, go back to our pipeline and let's look at the rest of the pipeline while it continues to download the world. So after we go ahead and uh, deploy to our development environment, we'll have an automated promotion to our user acceptance test environment. We're going to be using the image stream tagging promotion strategy, strategy that we talked about earlier. So we're going to reference the, the image stream from our UAT project to our development project. And finally, once our application is deployed in UAT, we're going to perform an acceptance check from our Jenkins server to the running application. We're going to basically hit one of the endpoints, make sure it gets the response back, and that will be a nice acceptance, point of view, acceptance check for our application. And then finally, what we'll do is we will, before we go to production, we'll have a manual input. So we'll have someone manually go in and promote the application to production. Let's go back and let's see how we're doing on, the, on, the, on, our, on our Maven build. It's still downloading the world. Are there any, I, I apologize, I'm going to cut you off. Are there any questions that we might be able to answer now just to make sure we don't run out of time for questions? I know we're going to be down to 14 minutes here. We have about six minutes left in our demo, I'm guessing. Question, yes? Do you recommend having an external tester um, that would execute your application once they're in the various environments to make sure that you're not running a, uh, an instance of an application within your organization to test another application? You want to test the whole ecosystem. Correct. So especially if you have, uh, the question was, if you have a external tool, in, should you have an external tool in place to help facilitate the testing process? And yes, I would, because I'd like to make sure that my, the ingress points are working as appropriate, because right now we're hitting a lot of the internal uh, Kubernetes services. So we want to make sure that our HA proxy router, if we're using the default HA proxy router, though that works as appropriate as well. But actually, now that I think about it, you're right. We, I, we, for this test, we are using the internal Kubernetes service. So I definitely agree. If you're using a full soak test and making sure to invalidate all your endpoints, we want to make sure that we are going ahead and running that outside OpenShift. Or at least, if we're not running it outside OpenShift, we're using the externally facing DNS address so it goes out and comes back in. Any other questions? Yes. So the, so the question was, what are, the, um, what are the issues with running a single cluster of OpenShift versus multiple clusters of OpenShift? And it comes down to two things. One, there is some political around it. Number two is resources. Do you want to have your production applications potentially in the same pool of resources as your development environment? So that's why we typically recommend having at least a non-production in your production cluster so that you, there's no issues with your production resources. Any other questions? Yes? Just a quick one. I know it's a demo. Um, when you, you made a change to the core, I know the change was small. It was just a compliance yes. file. Yes. But at what point would the core get checked before it got allowed to move through the pipeline? Right. So, so the question was, you know, we made a very simple change to our base image pipeline. We didn't go ahead and do a valid, we didn't go ahead and deploy an application to test validating that. That's true. In a typical use case, you would go ahead and deploy an application before it even hits your application team, just to validate that your ops team's application, your ops team's changes don't break any applications. Right. So in a typical environment, yes, you would go ahead and do that. Yeah. So basically, you would just have, add a few more steps to your base, your ops pipeline.
So the question was, let's say your base image changes. How do you, con and you have a number of different applications that are dependent on that base image. How do you know whether you should go ahead and um, facilitate the build process based on that change? Is that, that, that correct? So it comes down to, um, give me a moment to think about that one. So remember, we're not going to production right away. We're going to lower level environments. And it's however you separate your gates and balances between the different promotion processes that really enables when you go between different environments. So if you want, you can, you can have a manual promotion process at every level. So you, let's say we go ahead and automatically deploy it to, let's say, dev. We deploy, we deploy to dev, we can have developers test it, and then when developers feel comfortable, they can then send it off to, to UAT for our user acceptance tests to occur. Well, they, so Docker itself is a layered file system, right. so they would ha so they would have to be redeployed because your base underlying your underlying base image changes. Right, right, right. This, what I'm trying to say, I guess, how do I know this base image has changed and I need to go rebuild? Well, that's one of the benefits of OpenShift. We're lever we're leveraging the image we're lever the image stream image stream triggers. So as soon as it detects that new image is available, it's going to go ahead and automatically kick off that pipeline. Okay. Correct. You, you, right. Um, the question was, it comes down to, can you go ahead and add additional gates and balances at different layers in your ops pipeline? Of course. You can go ahead and put gates and balances anywhere. The key that, I want, that we wanted to emphasize here is, that a change was made, we're going to assume that it was, val it was verified and, va and validated from our ops team and made it available to um, the downstream consumers. And if you wanted to go ahead and add those additional gates and balances, you could easily do that. So as you see, we've gone ahead and we've finished downloading the world. We're going ahead and now taking that image, that, the, the artifacts that we've now built successfully in Jenkins, we're pushing it to OpenShift to perform that Docker build to a new Docker image, and then pushing that to the integrated Docker registry in our dev project. It's already done that, so if you see right here, let me see if I can make it a little bigger. My computer's loving me. Let's go ahead and do actual size, get back to reset. So we've gone ahead and we've, we're deploying to dev, and now what we're doing is we're validating the deployment of our application in the development environment. And now we're going ahead and we've already done that, and we're having that automated deployment to our user acceptance test environment. Yes? What would that validation check be? It was just making sure that it, that, it, that it deployed successfully. It wasn't doing any hard acceptance checks. The question was, uh, what were we doing to validate that it deployed successfully? We were hitting the OpenShift API to validate that the deployment was successful. Our application is configured to, to have readiness probes. So Kubernetes and OpenShift has a concept of readiness probes. So when we have an HTTP GET, so basically we're hitting the endpoint for our application. And if it returns 200 or OK, we know our application is up and running. That's basically what it was doing. So now, it's gone ahead and promoted our application to the UAT environment, it's gone ahead and um, ran an application verification test by hitting one of those endpoints. And now, as you see, we're, we're sitting here. We're waiting at the, at the um, step before we promote to production. So if we go look at our pipeline here, we're sitting here waiting to promote to production, and we have this button, proceed or abort. So that, that's that concept of continuous delivery, where we're not going ahead and automatically promoting to production. We're going ahead and making sure that we really want to go to production. Now, we had an automated test that went and checked to see if we hit an endpoint. But I want to make sure that the change we made, is that compliance file, actually is in our application. So the good news is, in OpenShift, we can go in and terminal into that pod and kind of browse around. So we're going to do that now. So we're going to go into our UAT project, go into our running pod, so go to the terminal tab, 
we have a brand new terminal. This is running now within our, within our OpenShift environment. So we'll just do CD. Where did you put it, Jared? Uh, it was an opt. Okay. OpenShift. And you should see a file called compliance. And there we go. We now have our compliance file there. Let's cat it just to make sure that we're keeping ourselves honest here. Hello, Summit. So we now see the value of a change being made by our ops team, running through its pipeline, triggering new deployments of our new, a build, new build pipeline of all of our applications, just the one that we have here, and seeing that roll all the way out through almost to production. Let's go back over to our, to our pipeline. We're still waiting. We're not running in production yet. So what I want to do now is I don't have access to, to actually promote the application. I don't. I, I, I'm a dev guy. Jared's an ops guy. We need someone with a little more power. Who wants to come up here and help us promote this application to production? Anybody? Come on. Come on. All right, come on up here. You know you want to come up here and promote it. Yeah. You can't. It just happened. All right. As you see now, it's going ahead and continuing on with the pipeline, tagging the application from our UAT environment. Thank you very much, sir. Going ahead, promoting it over from UAT to production. It's going to validate that it's running. And hopefully in a second, we'll then see our application, not only the pipeline complete successfully, but let's go see the application that we built. I mean, we talked about it. What is this application, this magical application out there? So we're validating, validating, validating. Great. Deployment succeeded. Perfect. End of pipeline. All done. Sweet. Let's go back to our prod project. Let's go click on our application. And we got a wonderful application out here where we can see some information about it. We have a pod that's called OSE API App 7 and a random hash after it. And then the time that it took to deploy, the, the timestamp of the deployment. Now, unfortunately, uh, or the, probably the, the timestamp of the deployment now. I think it's on UTC time, so it's a few hours off, but not too bad. And as you can see, the value of really change, making a change to our base image, having it go through the entire process of not only changing the base image pipeline, flowing in, updating all of our application pipeline, and then eventually making its way all the way through our app pipeline to production, all in about 10 minutes. How many of you could ha have a process that probably takes a couple days. How long does it take, typically? A couple days? A couple weeks? Months? OK, well, OK, perfect. So we have a couple, two more slides to show before we head out. And that's going to be, we're going to head back to our presentation really fast. So in a second, we'll go ahead and pop all the way through. Go ahead and present. Come on, internet. You can do it, I swear. Oh. So close. So I have, we have one more big surprise for you. And I don't want you to miss this. This is the best part about the demo. And I will literally go in and walk the computer around with our offline copy so you can see it. Can we go in and literally just go to the edit? <laughs> Is I... Do you think you can get there? We're going to fly through this. Isn't slides.com great? All the way to the end. We can do it. We got two minutes. Sweet. Don't leave here empty handed. This entire demo you just saw, you can go home and take at home by yourself and run it. Two. You can run it on the Red Hat Container Development Kit. So you can go ahead and see the value and benefit of a fully containerized platform with multiple pipelines. And the best part about it is you have your own Git server in there. You can go make code changes. You can go change the pipeline. It's all in Jenkins file, all out there. Really, it's up to you. It's seeing real world solutions in your hands in minutes. Go ahead to that URL. It's a GitHub repository. And we're going to continue to maintain it. So it's only going to get better and better, I promise you. One other thing we'd like to uh, tell you about uh, one of our 
op our open re innovation labs. It's bringing you one step closer to innovation. Please stop by our booth and in our, our consulting discovery zone, West Lobby, Lobby Level 2. You'll find all about these great things. Uh, you'll find me, some of my compadres, and a very uh, a lot of other smart experts there. Uh, come check us out. Thank you very much.